Hi all, thanks for joining me for this presentation today. Seven years ago, I attended a conference session uh, where someone talked about exploring Docker for Hadoop. Today is a big privilege for me to uh, present about some of the work that we've done at Uber, where we have Dockerized our entire Hadoop infrastructure. Over the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to share our containerization journey. Before we go into the details, a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Matt. Um, I worked on Apache Ambari in the early days, a Hadoop cluster management system. I joined Uber in 2016 and pretty much worked in the same domain, uh, working on Hadoop clusters. And since then, I've expanded my scope into the broader data infrastructure. Uh, currently, I lead the deployment and automation domain for data infrastructure, which, al which also includes containerization and uh, container orchestration of the stack. Uh, outside of this domain, I also follow new developments in uh, the data architecture space, uh, which includes uh, the data mesh and projects that enable it like open that data. We have an action-packed agenda today. Uh, I'll, I'll cover how we used to manage Hadoop infrastructure back in the day and what, us, uh, what made us uh, adopt containers. I'll walk through some of the challenges that we faced as we adopted containers. Um, uh, one of the biggest parts of adopting containers was the migration itself. I'll talk a little bit about how we engineered the migration and into details of some of the specific strategies that we used for making the migration easier. Uh, I'll briefly discuss about the cultural shift uh, within the team as we uh, went along with this migration, some of the key takeaways from this presentation, and also give a glimpse of what we are going to work on in the future. With that said, uh, jumping into the background, uh, Hadoop today powers the entire batch analytics stack at Uber. Everything from mobile click events, online DB change events, are ingested into the Hadoop infrastructure. And uh, this powers a whole bunch of analytics for Uber, including ETA prediction, decision-making for pricing and promotion, ML, and whatnot. Uh, the Hadoop infrastructure itself comprises of uh, two, uh, two major services. One of them is SGFS and the other one is Yarn. SGFS is our uh, distributed file system and Yarn is a resource management system for uh, launching your distributed applications. Before going further into the details of the presentation, I'd like to do a quick refresher on the Hadoop architecture. On the left side, you will see the SDFS architecture where we have a central name node which stores the metadata about files, basically files to block mapping. And the SDFS architecture also has data nodes which stores the blocks themselves. Uh, together, they form a distributed file system. On the Yarn side, which is on the right side of the slide, uh, we have a resource manager, which is uh, the central system that controls resources across the entire cluster. Um, clients and users submit applications to the resource manager. The resource manager is in charge of uh, ensuring that these distributed applications get uh, allocated containers to run across the entire fleet. Uh, node manager is uh, the node level agent, which is responsible for uh, starting and stopping containers and basically ensuring that your uh, containers are running in the fleet. One common thing that you would see here is that uh, both SDFs and YARN have uh, a sort of control planes where name node and resource manager are kind of control planes within the value architecture. And we also have data nodes and node managers, which are kind of the data plane of, uh, of the Hadoop stack. Uh, one other point to mention over here is that uh, Hadoop is a very traditional system. It is uh, built and designed for bare metal, and it has been run traditionally in the industry for bare metal, uh, in bare metal, or on uh, VMs. Uh, when I, when I mention containers in this architecture, these containers are typically JVM processes running on the host and they're not necessarily like Docker containers. This slide is a very good overview of how our team has evolved and what is the, uh, how the scope of the team has evolved. Uh, I joined the team in 2016 where we had an SRE team with uh, three or four members. And uh, 
in late 2017, early 2018, we uh, amended the team by adding an additional sub team, uh, which worked on development on the code Hadoop side. Uh, by late 2019, we merged the team, merged both sub teams together into a single uh, DevOps team, uh, which which is after after which we had a lot of innovation happening in uh, moving Hadoop to containers. Until then, until uh, early 2020 or so, we were using a lot of ad hoc scripts, tools, and uh, a lot of tooling written in different languages to maintain our Hadoop infrastructure. Uh, by mid-2020, we started adopting containers, and uh, there's a reason why we started uh, adopting containers after, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, one of the other things to look into is uh, how the fleet size has grown over the years. Uh, you'll see this blue line over here, which uh, showcases that the fleet size grew exponentially from a few hundreds to the 10,000s, 20,000s range, whereas our engineer engineering uh, team uh, grew only 3x in that time frame. Uh, as we scaled our clusters, we, we got to a point where we were managing 25,000 plus posts. Uh, the Hadoop infrastructure was supporting 350,000 distinct applications or jobs per day. I'll be using applications and jobs interchangeably in this presentation. And these jobs or applications have um, a uh, very short lifetime, they run for a few hours or so and uh, do an ETL job or some magician job and basically uh, come back the next day and uh, run in a similar fashion. Now, these are all distributed applications. So these 350,000 jobs were translating to 20 million plus uh, JVM processes launched across the fleet on a daily basis. Uh, as, we, as we scaled, uh, our Hadoop infrastructure over the years, uh, it, it became inevitable to invest people in doing zone turnups, zone decoms, OS upgrades, and whatnot. Uh, these fleet-wide operations became uh, cumbersome for the team in general due to the lack of automation and uh, operational excellence. And, and this was our major turning point. We were repeatedly assigning people every every six months to do one of these fleet-wide operations. And uh, this is when we um, made a big decision to move to Docker containers and rely on con a container orchestration system, which is in-house internally built to uh, simplify our operations. Given that I've set the context, I'd like to move into some of the challenges that we uh, that we faced along the containerization journey. As I was preparing this presentation, I, I created a list of challenges that we faced, and I ended up with a long list. So I'm, I'm going to present uh, the top three important ones that I felt was uh, more meaningful for this audience, and I'll walk through them in the next few slides. The first challenge that we faced was uh, multi-cluster management. Uh, Hadoop is notorious for having thousands of config files for making one, one single cluster. Uh, back in 2016, we had two clusters to manage. It was uh, relatively easy to manage their configs, but by 2020, we had around 40 to 50 clusters to, to manage. The typical practice within the team to manage uh, clusters was to create a new directory in a Git repository, uh, copy paste the Hadoop default configs from open source, uh, customize it, and by that time you have uh, deployed the configs to the cluster, you might have already ended up with uh, a thousand plus lines of configs. Uh, there's, a, there's a snippet over here which shows uh, one of our internal clusters, Broman, and the number of lines in the config files that a developer has to uh, manage, which is around a thousand plus. Uh, if we multiply this thousand with 40 to 50 clusters, it's easily like 40,000, 50,000 lines, and uh, it became a bigger maintenance problem uh, for us in general. So we we thought about this uh, solution. We uh, revamped the entire config, uh, config and cluster management uh, system in such a way that we, we plucked out all the common configs and put them into a specific part of the code. We looked into uh, 
defining different cluster types and also defining uh, the cluster names and tying them to cluster types, uh, adding a bunch of template files which were uh, generate which were used for generating XML files which Hadoop understood. And we have this config generator which uh, gets all these inputs and generates the configs file at a at a cluster level. Uh, once these files are generated, we save them into the Docker image and our container orchestration system deploys it to each of the clusters. During deployment, a set of runtime variables are injected and these runtime variables included host name, cluster name, ports, and whatnot. Uh, some of these variables such as cluster name uh, provided enough input to basically pick the correct config files uh, for uh, running the container. Now, we uh, the the biggest benefit of this approach was the the configs and the cluster definitions was defined through a language called Starlark, which was pretty much four thousand bytes of code, and we were able to generate one hundred and fifty thousand lines of configs uh, through the system. Uh, so now this made it easy for us to uh, manage clusters in general. We also adopted a similar approach for maintaining not only the Hadoop configs, but also for our metrics and alerts and so on. So we basically follow similar templates. Uh, the second biggest challenge that we uh, had back in the day was security being an overhead. But the old process of uh, adding nodes to the cluster kind of, kind of looked like this, where uh, someone goes and provisions those, and then uh, you talk to someone in a different team to generate secrets for these hosts. You kind of SCP the secrets to these hosts, and then you start the Hadoop process with them uh, later joins the cluster. Uh, as part of uh, con our containerization and automation journey, we we thought about infrastructure security from the start uh, because that was very critical for automation to just work. Uh, so. Uh, uh, within Uber, we use uh, one of our uh, proprietary container orchestration systems uh, to do to to do all of this, um, the container deployment, automation, and demo. Uh, what you see in this picture here is a very simplified diagram on how we uh, how we provision secrets and uh, secrets for uh, for each of the nodes that we add to the cluster. The very first process that we bring up on the host is uh, something that we that that is called a spire agent uh, spire is pretty much based on spp authentication protocol it basically uh, provides identities and uh, provides a way to trust software systems within a distributed system uh, once the spire agent up spire agent is up the node is attested and uh, the next process uh, the cluster manager agent is able to come up and report to the cluster manager server saying, hey, this 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 node is up and would like to join the cluster with this uh, attested token. Now, the cluster manager server upon receiving this request basically ensures that uh, a secret is created for the, Hadoop, uh, the, for the Hadoop worker. The Hadoop worker is pretty much a custom sidecar container, which is managed by the Hadoop team, which again, authenticates with the Spire agent gets the token, reads the secret, and provides it to the Hadoop process, which is the, either the data node, the name node, the young node manager, and so on. Uh, with this, we basically uh, put in all the, all the security-related uh, automation into the overall automation of uh, container orchestration. The third big challenge was orchestrating the entire distributed system by itself. Uh, this, this, this is a very simplified diagram of the stack on uh, the number of containers that we run across both SDFs and YAN. SDFs are supported by around 30,000 plus containers and YAN by around 70,000 plus, plus containers. So overall, we, we run at least 100,000 containers um, on a steady state basis supporting Hadoop infrastructure. On top of that, we have customer applications which uh, launch 20 million plus new containers on a daily basis. Uh, the challenge that we are talking about is the, the bottom part of the stack on 
maintaining 100,000 containers at scale. Uh, like I mentioned before, we use an internal container orchestration system, uh, which is uh, proprietary to Uber for uh, managing all of our Docker containers. Uh, this diagram showcases uh, how uh, how these how the interaction happens between uh, the user or automation uh, to add or decom nodes uh, to uh, SDFS as a distributed system. One of the key things over here is that SDFS, unlike other services that you run on a system like Kubernetes, has uh, has different roles. Uh, like I mentioned before, this SDFS control plane, this SDFS data plane, which are data nodes. Uh, so these have different roles. And one of the key important aspects is that both of these systems, both of these roles are basically stateful systems. Uh, so maintaining containers at scale uh, without compromising on durability of data is a big challenge by itself. And automating on top of that to do large scale of uh, large scale fleet operations is another step forward in uh, for us in terms of automation. Uh, going into the details, the user or automation input is basically given to the cl cluster manager control plane. Once uh, let's take add adding a node to the cluster as an example. While adding a node, uh, the cluster manager control plane changes a state, which is uh, somewhere in the system, and the state is propagated into uh, the Hadoop worker next to the SDFS control plane. The SDFS control plane basically gets information that, hey, a new node is supposed to be added and registers the node with itself. The cluster manager system basically provides the node level information, uh, such as container version, the container type, and so on, to uh, to the node where the container should be started, uh, which is given to the Hadoop worker, again, a sidecar agent, sidecar container. And the sidecar container launches the SDFS data, data node, which connects to the SDFS control plane. So what you see here is a lot of coordination between these different systems and how they work together. Uh, one of the key things to notice over here is all of this is based on a goal state or a decide state, and all of these operations are happening in, in, a, in, in a synchronous manner. And there are, there are loops which actually control all of these operations. This is uh, a diagram that I took from uh, one of our previous blog, blog posts, which was published last year. It is a full overview of uh, how different parts, different components in in our architecture supports uh, Hadoop infrastructure and containers today. I'm not going to go into details of everything over here, uh, but I would like to highlight a few key points over here. Uh, there, there are two aspects over here. One is this entire system is based on a, a desired state or a goal state, and we have uh, desired states or goal states at different levels of the of the system. For example, we have desired state for, for an SDFS cluster, and we also have desired state for each node within the cluster. Uh, on, on top of that, we have actual state being collected from uh, different parts of the system, including each of the nodes, and then building the entire cluster actual state. We have uh, basically control, group, control loops or reconciliation loops, which look at the difference between the desired and actual states, and um, basically trigger actions to uh, move the state of the system towards the desired state. Uh, on, the, on the top right, you will see a circle which is pretty much uh, showcasing how the cluster goal state and cluster desired state, that reconciliation loop that happens over there. And also the, the left bottom red circle showcases that there's a reconciliation loop within the node itself to ensure that the containers are running or stopped. Uh, all of these cluster level uh, reconciliations are triggered through cadence, a workflow management system, and uh, that has scaled to uh, support our Hadoop infrastructure so far. In the next few slides, I'd like to talk about how we engineered the migration. Uh, one of the questions that I that I got when we were sharing uh, some of our learnings with uh, our peer companies was whether we took downtime for the migration. 
we actually took zero downtime uh, for the migration. Uh, it is typical for some of the companies that run batch analytics stack to shut down the stack for a while, upgrade the cluster, and then turn on all the pipelines. But due to the nature of Uber's business, we uh, we can't shut down any of the pipelines. We can't. Um, basically, it will affect uh, some of our uh, business use cases. So we never took downtime for the migration. But that actually pushed us uh, towards looking at the migration in an engineering way. And in the next few slides, I'll talk through some of the strategies that we adopted for uh, engineering the migration. The first strategy that we adopted was, you know, how can we optimize for the ROI? So as I mentioned before, there's both control planes and data planes in the Hadoop infrastructure system. And the control planes are a few in number. There's uh, literally like five to 20 to deal with, whereas the data plane is in the thousand scale. So we focused on uh, the biggest part of the fleet, which, which is making the migration easier for the data plane. And we invested heavily in uh, building automated workflows to do the migration. And this was again based on uh, cadence. Uh, this graph showcases how we you know, ran through the migration. Uh, you'll see that uh, the graph goes up all the way to hundreds of 200s, which means that was like the peak of how many nodes were decommissioned and kind of piling up in our pool for basically going through the containerization process. And as the graph goes down, that's when the nodes were kind of cleansed, uh, added with um, the Docker, Docker daemon and other system-related processes and added back to the cluster. Uh, we ran this automation for several months, and uh, within uh, within a year or so, we were able to basically migrate uh, more than seventy five percent of the cluster through through these automated workflows. The second strategy that we chose was uh, how do we make uh, things compatible between the legacy bare metal JVM way of running things to uh, the new Docker way of running things. And we identified two different areas where compatibility really did matter. And that was based on uh, what was visible to the customers. Uh, the first area of what that was visible to customers was uh, where their jobs run. Their jobs used to run on uh, bare metal machines as JVM processes, but in the new system, they would be running as Docker containers. So that, that would be on the data plane. Uh, the second part which we looked into was uh, how do the customers interact with the Hadoop stack? And their interactions are typically with the control planes, so whether you're submitting a job or listing something on the file system that goes through goes to the, uh, the Hadoop control planes. So going into details of how we made, uh, made it compatible between the legacy data plane and the the Docker Docker based data plane. Uh, the first thing that we did is we looked into all the dependencies on the all the dependent libraries on the legacy bare metal host. We basically created a Docker image with all these base dependencies. So as we as customers were submitting applications to Hadoop uh, Hadoop infrastructure, we basically injected uh, the, the jars that they were submitting into the base Docker image that we were providing uh, used uh, within our Hadoop infrastructure and ensuring that the customers, the customer did not even know that their JVM processes were, were running in containers uh, because of some of the changes that we did. It was completely transparent to them. So this was, uh, this was something that we did underneath the hood. Uh, the second aspect of the data plane migration was more around uh, how did we validate this? There are hundreds of 200, 200 libraries that uh, customers depended on, and it was very hard to figure out what is the full set that is required to make the migration work for all the 350,000 applications and 20, 20 million plus containers launched per day. So to come up with a very good migration strategy, we actually partitioned the cluster where we had two subclusters, one which is in red, which is the uh, legacy stack and the one which is in purple, which is the uh, Docker-based stack. And we started, uh, we built a transformation uh, function within our uh, control plane to 
move some of the workloads which were in uh, the legacy bare metal to the Docker-based uh, setup. And this provided us a good amount of insights by shattering some of these jobs into, into the Docker-based Docker based fleet because that surfaced up some issues early on, which we basically fixed forward in an agile manner. Uh, however, the handheld movement of uh, 350,000 jobs would be would be kind of an impossible task for us. So as we started building confidence with 100, 200 jobs that we had shadowed, we basically changed our strategy and we kind of knocked down the partitions and said, we are going to uh, randomly distribute some of the uh, some of the Docker-based flows into the entire cluster and let applications run across both. And this is when uh, it was an epic moment for the team where we had applications uh, submitted by customers uh, where 20 of the containers, 20 containers out of the same application was running in Docker, whereas the rest 80 was running on bare metal. And they used to, they can communicate with each other and the applications run perfectly fine. Uh, we continued along by adding more uh, Docker-based hosts into the system and eventually uh, depleted the old legacy bare metal hosts from the uh, from the cluster. The, the second aspect was to make compatibility possible at the control plane level. So customers interact with SQFS name nodes and Yarn resource managers. And the way they interact with uh, these control planes are through uh, a typical Hadoop uh, Java binary, which is what we internally call as a Hadoop client. And the Hadoop client uh, consists of configs, uh, which point to the name nodes and the resource managers, which basically map to IPs in our system. Uh, due to the legacy nature of the stack, we built, uh, we started Hadoop back in the pre IPO days. We have hacked up a lot of systems. We have thousands of client usages where these IPs are hardcoded across the entire cluster. So one of the first things that we did over here was to uh, basically standardize the client and also the configs. So we moved to uh, uh, the basic DNS C name based approach where we have one single name which points to SGMS name nodes, another single name that points to young resource managers. And this change was orchestrated across the entire company uh, using um, a very decentralized effort called uh, the Hadoop uh, Client Standardization Effort. Uh, a good amount of the work was done also to uh, some of our monorepos. We have a single uh, repository that is shared across the entire company. So we were able to uh, upgrade the libraries uh, through a single, through a single uh, uh, diff in the monorepo. However, we required many of the teams to validate and basically redeploy some of their applications so that things wouldn't break. Once the control plane, uh, once the customers have adopted these new clients, it became easier for us to uh, move the control planes around because they're all uh, fronted by the C name. So we were able to move these control planes around. We were able to shut down one control plane node uh, move them into Docker, kind of validate and test, move it back. So this was kind of our strategy to move control plane of uh, Hadoop infrastructure into Docker. Uh, as part of this uh, big migration journey and containerization journey, I think one of the big biggest aspects that we uh, that we learned was the the cultural shift that happened within the team. Yeah, as of today, we have 99%, 99.4% of the Hadoop infrastructure running in Docker. Uh, we went through this transition from a, from a full SRE team to a Dell plus SRE team to the DevOps team. And moving to DevOps model actually brought us a lot of benefits in terms of uh, basically consolidating the work together, ensuring that the teams are more being more efficient, reducing the dev dev and release cycles. So this 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 the shift was pretty much uh, an eye-opening experience for us. We have also reduced the operational effort across um, across the team for managing Hadoop clusters. And we are also on a very strong trajectory to reduce the operational effort further for some of the bigger fleet-wide operations. Uh, the, I think one of the key parts which, uh, 
which was kind of a turning point for this uh, cultural shift was around uh, when back in 2020, when we had uh, the pandemic and everything started, there was this uh, hardware shortage that happened. And to mitigate the hardware shortage on our side, we had to uh, basically bin pack uh, SDFS and Yon in such a way that we we could reduce our cluster sizes and sustain uh, sustain our growth for the longer term. And uh, just because of the container orchestration system and the container based way of operating our clusters, we were able to do this bin packing within six months or so through automated workflows by just defining one policy to ensure everything is kind of uh, bin packed together. And this basically built uh, trust among the people who are kind of skeptical about Docker containers and finally got into the mode of, hey, this is, this is the way we should operate uh, Hadoop Hadoop work. Some of the key takeaways for us is that uh, containers made it really easy for us to manage Hadoop. Uh, the DevOps model of working basically improved our team productivity. And the, the key takeaway for myself, at least, having a super well-engineered strategy is very important for making large-scale migrations like these easier. We're almost towards the end of this presentation, but I'd like to provide a glimpse of some of the work that we're doing for the future. Uh, we have gotten very far with containerizing Hadoop and orchestrating Hadoop through containers. Uh, we are in the works of optimizing these, basically tuning some of the concurrency limits and doing drills to ensure we can do larger free part operation. Basically, can we turn over uh, thousands of hosts by the click of a button without any manual involvement. And we are still uh, polishing some of those edge cases and so on. And we have a big goal of reaching zero manual effort for zone turnups, decons, and fleet wide upgrades, something that we are planning to achieve in the next six to 12 months. Now, on top of that, uh, we have adopted containers as a foundation for our Hadoop infrastructure. With that, we have unlocked a lot of other opportunities, including uh, leveraging the cloud. Uh, we are currently looking at modernizing our data infrastructure check, and cloud basically plays a major part of that story. With that said, uh, that is the end of the presentation. Uh, happy to take any questions, and feel free to reach out to me offline if you have uh, more questions. Thank you all.